Greetings. This is Top Hat and Buttered Popcorn. My name is John Savers. I'm your host, and today we'll take a look at a couple of films, beginning with 300. Uh, this is a film uh, which probably should be put in the genre of historical fiction. Uh, I think it's clear that they play a little loose with the facts. But uh, it is set in ancient Greece, uh, Sparta in particular. We have the film opening up with a narrator who functions to introduce uh, the audience, the moviegoer, uh, to the film, the film's rendering of the culture of Sparta, to try to set them up and make them understand uh, what follows. Well, it's a pretty tough task because what follows is a small sea of skulls uh, and then the camera tipping up um, to a set of three people, one of which is a little baby boy. We have a fellow holding this baby boy, uh, a parent behind, apparently, a guardian. And the baby boy is being inspected to see if there are defects. Well, en passant, we have an indication uh, that this particular society may be um, genetically um, uh, conscious. Uh, it may be uh, trying to improve uh, the line uh, in a way which uh, is not uh, generally, I think, approved uh, nowadays. It's not something that uh, most people at any rate would uh, uh, step forward and, and loudly and vocally support. But um, it would seem, nevertheless, putting aside any questions of morality and stuff like this, that um, by eliminating the, the, the clearly, the obviously defective babies, um, uh, the chance of that uh, appearing again in future generations would be diminished. Uh, and over a long stretch of generations, much diminished. So um, there you have it, a, um, a sort of a scientific culture. One can imagine this particular culture actually disguised in, in Star Trek, you know, where uh, Kirk, et cetera, uh, stumble upon some planet uh, of this kind um, uh, with a disguised name in which uh, these sort of events are occurring. Now, I would imagine that um, overall Kirk would take a dim view of it, although uh, Dr. Spock might see a certain rationale in it. Um, at any rate, um, we, we do have this unfolding of uh, uh, the, uh, the culture uh, in which uh, since uh, survival belongs to the fittest and the Spartan culture wanted to survive, they were taking steps to um, try to ensure that they survive. Well, folks, we'll return now to the point at which we uh, departed. Um, here comes Theron, as I recall, uh, with the council, and he's the big antagonist uh, to King Leonidas uh, and his wife, as it will come. Uh, he is politically ambitious, uh, and he's trying to thwart King Leonidas uh, because uh, basically you, you have the impression he would like to replace King Leonidas with King Theron. At any rate, um, uh, the law of Sparta is once more uh, put forth before King Leonidas, told he cannot lead these men to war. It's uh, against the oracles and so forth. He said, well, hey, I'm not going to war. We're just going up north for a little walk, uh, doing a little exercise, fun and, and so forth, enjoying nature and 
so forth. Well, they don't buy it at all, but uh, what can they do? King Leonidas leads these men up north, uh, and eventually they make it to uh, the spot he has planned uh, at which to defend. Um, he has a farewell with his wife before going, which um, uh, is a romantic uh, uh, interlude uh, which takes on a kind of, um, um, should we say, demonstration of um, uh, potential uh, modes. At any rate, uh, it seemed rather odd uh, to me. And at any rate, um, uh, the Kama Sutra, uh, um, maybe he's been reading that too much before taking off uh, to, uh, to fight the Persian. Anyway, um, he goes up uh, with his men, and um, uh, they get to the place, uh, and uh, they look forward. Uh, it um, is a high uh, spot that um, looks out over the uh, Aegean. They see uh, a horde, a vast armada of ships uh, bobbing in the water. Uh, and then suddenly the winds come up, a storm and stuff like this, and uh, many, many of these uh, ships are sunk, apparently. The Trojans, yay, yay, uh, the gods are favoring us and so forth. Um, King Leonidas tells them, well, wait, 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 wait. Um, there are many, 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 many more uh, ships out there that we don't even see that are unaffected and whatnot, and this proves to be the case. Uh, so they go about setting up uh, for the uh, battle, making their plans of the structures, the um, ramparts, uh, and whatever needed to be done, honing their spears and whatnot, um, uh, and in good spirits. Uh, along the way, a strangely misshapen character in the wardrobe of the Spartan warrior comes forth. Uh, he, it turns out, was a misbegotten who somehow survived the big drop. Uh, he had gotten away and uh, grown to moderation, raised by his parents upon the culture and lore of the Spartans. Uh, he now presented himself to King Leonidas and asked that he be allowed to fight, that he was a Spartan by blood, uh, and he wanted to fight uh, against the Persians. Uh, King Leonidas uh, checked him out. Uh, he demonstrated, that is, the misbegotten had demonstrated uh, his uh, uh, Spartan spear thrust, and um, King Leonidas agreed it was a, uh, a good one. Uh, and then he said, uh, well, now lift your shield. Uh, and it turned out that he couldn't really lift his shield. Uh, he had apparently one good arm, and the other one was just um, functional, okay, but not uh, strong. So King Leonidas said, well, look, uh, I'm sorry, but we can't use you. We can't have a weak, uh, weak uh, link. Uh, the whole uh, military plan of the Spartans depends upon every member being um, strong, and uh, we can't have a weak, a weak link at all or, or we're uh, going to lose. So uh, I'm sorry, we can't do it. Uh, this fellow is... Um, really disturbed about this, he says, uh, no, King Leonidas, you making a mistake, no. But uh, the decision is made, so he goes on off. Uh, he will be a figure uh, we'll see again. So uh, we get some more uh, uh, Persians uh, on the scene. We get another emissary. He comes forward. Uh, he offers King Leonidas uh, in Sparta, uh, preeminence in the uh, Peloponnesus, they will be the, he will be the new king of all of Greece, uh, and he will be subject only to King Dione uh, Xerxes, the uh, god king. Uh, and um, I, uh, this is uh, kind of rejected by King Leonidas. The emissary then says words to the effect, uh, King Xerxes, um, uh, he is the king of a thousand nations. How can you stand up against uh, this? Uh, it's suicide and so forth. It's like Jorge the W uh, telling the Iranians, uh, the world community is opposed to what you're doing. 
we are going to punish you if you do not uh, accept our will. Uh, and um, how can you even think uh, to challenge the world community? Well, um, maybe present Iran has something of the same types as old Sparta had. King Leonidas said, beat it, you know, get out of here. In fact, they may have killed him, I don't know. But uh, the Spartans uh, were not really too ambassadorial. They didn't like what uh, they heard. They were more likely to kill you than anything else. But at any rate, um, uh, the war then commences, and uh, most of the film is seen, uh, we see this uh, fighting various groups and so forth. Uh, uh, it starts out with a lesser amongst the uh, uh, nations, uh, providing uh, the uh, manpower to be slaughtered, and then it progresses all the way to uh, Xerxes, sort of Praetorian Guard, uh, Praetorian Guard, um, uh, who are called the Invincibles, and they had kind of a golden mask on. It was rather grotesque. I thought that the helmets of the uh, Spartans were rather uh, fierce looking myself. I thought they were rather formidable looking. They had large round uh, uh, shields, heavy also. Now, when the fighting first commences and so, so forth, we see the Spartans uh, fighting in a rather uh, choreographed style. Uh, itself something of an echo, lyrical echo, to that of the oracle uh, dancing in the wind, as it were. Uh, we see them uh, going through uh, their methods of fighting uh, with great success and so forth. Uh, and um, uh, it does get bloody, uh, and uh, uh, heads and arms and all that go, and, and what for. Uh, the thing keeps on going and going. More enemies. Um, we see rhinos uh, come into the game and uh, elephants or horses, all kinds of critters that the uh, Spartans have to go up against. Finally, it comes to just about uh, the worst possible moment. Uh, they've lost quite a few now. But this misbegotten fellow, it turns out uh, to be... Um, looking for favor from Xerxes. Uh, he is brought forward. Uh, he's going to lead them up a secret back way to get behind the Spartans uh, and to allow the uh, Persians to um, uh, encircle uh, the uh, Spartans to their doom. Uh, he is treated to a sensual uh, feast. I'm sure he has never experienced in his life. We see uh, a bunch of uh, uh, well shapely uh, uh, lasses uh, wiggling and uh, waving and, uh, and whatnot um, uh, in a, a sensual kind of um, milieu, uh, which uh, I think he cheerfully joined. He does turn traitor. Uh, also, it might be said that Xerxes himself um, not only is quite tall, he looks almost from camera angles to be uh, like seven foot five inches tall or something, quite tall. Uh, he also is bald headed, has lots of chains and so forth. And I thought he had something of an androgynous look to him. Uh, perhaps this was meant uh, to contrast with the Spartans and perhaps it was meant to suggest the effete and sensual and uh, uh, corrupt East. At any rate, uh, he eventually has his own little powwow with Leonidas. Uh, Leonidas uh, then seems to um, uh, capitulate uh, to uh, uh, the offer of um, Xerxes uh, to accept Xerxes as God, King, and Sovereign. Uh, and then uh, it turns out that it's a ruse. Leonidas grabs his spear and flings it at the uh, Xerxes figure, uh, his spear point grazing the mouth of um, uh, Xerxes and bringing forth blood. And uh, we see Xerxes checking it out and seeing his own blood, uh, and he is shocked. Wow. This is not supposed to happen to a god, uh, you know, to um, uh, look down and see uh, blood leaking out and stuff. Well, at any rate, uh, 
the fight commences to the very end. Uh, the uh, Spartans dwindle down to a precious few. Uh, most of them are wounded, uh, and um, uh, it, um, it finally ends up with uh, poignant uh, expressions, you know, of somebody who has about a thousand wounds in him calling up to King Leonidas, who has a thousand wounds, and he says uh, something like, um, um, Leonidas, uh, it has been a pleasure to be able to uh, die in your company. Uh, and King Leonidas turning and saying, Plotosis, uh, it's a pleasure to have lived in your, com your, your, your company, and, and so forth. Well, anyway, there is one Spartan, a Spartan who has lost his eye in the combat, who is bade before the end by King Leonidas to go back to Sparta and to tell the Spartans what he had seen. And he does still have one good, <laughs> one good eye, eye to, to do the uh, rendering for him. At any rate, um, uh, he does go back. Now, I, it must be said, at the same time, his wife has been trying to get the council to declare war and to send men to help King Leonidas. She has even gone to Theron to try to win him over. Uh, he has made a kind of quid pro quo type offer, that is, um, uh, sexual favors for his uh, support at the council. Uh, this she reluctantly provides, and when she goes to speak before the council, this cad comes forward uh, and then more or less calls her adulteress uh, and says, why should we, the council, the noble council of Sparta, follow the words of an adulteress, a soiled woman, a fallen woman, uh, someone who has betrayed her own king, uh, and, uh, and so forth. She is ticked off. She gets a sword and impales Theron with it, and in the process seems to have hit the money bag he has. Coins fall down on the floor, and they have the depiction of King Xerxes. When the council, other council members see the coins, they start screaming, traitor, traitor, traitor. Uh, so uh, she has uh, apparently uh, won the, uh, the day uh, by this impalement. But um, when this fellow with one eye makes it back and tells the Spartans what he has seen, uh, it's the... Um, the icing on the cake, so to speak, uh, and they prepare to go to war. Um, and uh, at the end, we see um, that the 300 have died, including King Leonidas, minus the one. Uh, and um, uh, the armies of the Persians are apparently on Greece land, Greek land, and the, uh, the real mast army of Sparta, some 30,000 strong, uh, is ready to go to war. Uh, it, um, uh, whether or not they have Archean, Archaeans uh, with them or not, I can't say, but um, uh, we did have one amusing episode in which uh, King Leonidas, when he's leading his men at first, uh, is joined by an old friend, uh, uh, Archaeans, um, uh, who uh, turn out to be basically shopkeepers with spears. Uh, and uh, uh, King Leonidas uh, kind of chides his friend for questioning the Spartans uh, uh, and their valor. He says, I've got more warriors than you do. Anyway, um, it, it's an interesting film uh, in some respects. Um, and um, uh, it is shown in a kind of sepia that gives the characters a kind of a bronzed cast, I thought a metallic looking cast, but uh, I, I think that they're pretty loose with uh, the facts of the matter uh, and so forth. It does also kind of recall uh, the biblical account of the 300 uh, uh, Israelites um, and uh, kind of reinforces in my mind that these 300 may be witnesses uh, to um, those 300 and the power of God. But at any rate, um, uh, we'll let, be done at this point.
out of time again. This is Top Hat and Buttered Popcorn. My name is John Savers. I'm your host. I appreciate your tuning in.